to the What Bitcoin Did podcast. Hi there, welcome to the What Bitcoin Did podcast. This week I am over in Tokyo in Japan as yesterday I interviewed Roger Veer. Um, very cool city, highly recommend it if you haven't been out here. Um, but this is going to be one of my slightly longer intros. I do this occasionally on certain interviews because the Sometimes there's a few things I want to get across, and with Roger being such a controversial figure in the crypto space, there are some things I want to get across. As you know, naturally, a few people aren't particularly happy that I've done this interview. Um, so, look, firstly, I just want to talk about my sponsor, Trade.io. I am working with them on a full announcement next week. We were hoping to do it this week, uh, but it hasn't happened, so it will be next week. They have given me beta access to their platform, so I'm going to take a look at that. And they've also agreed to do a, a competition with me where one of you will win a holiday, all expenses paid, over to Cyprus, to where they are based, and also be within the chance of winning $100,000. So I will share that with you all next week. Okay, so interview with Roger naturally has brought a bunch of people out who are particularly happy about this. Um, people who have said, why am I interviewing him? Why would I give a platform to a scammer? And have I been paid? And, and you know, all the normal stuff. And similar to my interview with Craig, I don't mind. I will interview anyone in the space. And I am new to interviewing, but I will do my best to challenge people who I don't agree with and don't support. So I thought I would just tell a little bit about why I did the interview, what my approach was, and some of my thoughts afterwards. And let's just be very clear from the start. Everyone who's having a go at me, let's be very clear. I am not a Bitcoin Cash fan, and I'm not a fan of Roger Veer. I went into the interview actually being blocked by him on Twitter, as I have challenged him on a number of things. Yet he still agreed to do the interview. And whether people like it or not, Bitcoin Cash is part of the ecosystem. It exists on many exchanges. And whether you like it or not, it has a near 30 billion cap. And if people sign up to Coinbase... They can buy it. So I think it's far more useful to interview everyone in the space and put the you know the relevant challenges across them when they're required. And some are saying, well, you're giving a platform to his nonsense. And alternatively, I could say, well, actually, no, I'm challenging him. And some people who might not be aware of some of the issues or the questions regarding Bitcoin Cash may have had their mind open to it. Anyone else is, is usually found their kind of stance in the space, whether they're Bitcoin or Bitcoin Cash, and it's going to be very hard to move them. I expect after this, I'm going to have a bunch of people who say, yeah, you did a great job, people, and a bunch of people say, you're a fucking idiot, and, and that's fine. I'm not going to change my stance. I am going to interview people as and when I can if I think there's a story to be told and questions to be asked. And, you know, in preparation for this interview, I did watch a whole bunch of interviews with Roger. Um, and I just wanted mine to be different. So, you know, if you're hoping that I've gone out there to have a big argument with Roger, I didn't fly halfway across the world to uh, trigger him for a rage quit in 10 minutes and, and, and waste my time. If you want that, there's a really good interview with John Carvalho. I'll share that in the show notes. That's already happened. If you want a deep technical conversation, there are people who are far more experienced in the tech than me and are far more equipped to have that debate. And there's a really good one with uh, Richard Hart and a really good one with Jameson Lopp. And I'll share both of those with you. What I wanted from mine is to understand a bit more about Roger and his motivations and try and get my head around why he behaves in the way he does and why he does the things he does. So it took a lot of research, and I do want to say a, a thank you out there. Um, there's a guy on Twitter called Wilson Trodler. Yeah, very smart guy, very good trader, very, very uh, knowledgeable guy who helped me with a lot of my prep. So look, uh, thanks to him. Meeting up with Roger confirmed why I do these interviews in person. In some ways, it was kind of a strange experience. When I arrived at the office, for some reason, I expected it to be some big operation, but actually, it kind of wasn't. There was a handful of people in the office in kind of a small, nondescript uh, street, and I don't know, it just wasn't what I expected. I expected some big you know, busy operation. And maybe that's because, you know, staff are distributed around the world. I, I don't know. It just wasn't what I expected. And when I first met Roger, he was really nice, but he did want me to download a wallet and he wanted to show me how the Bitcoin.com wallet worked, which actually was a really bad start because when I opened the wallet, there was a Bitcoin Cash wallet, but what he would call Bitcoin Core and I would call Bitcoin didn't have a wallet and I had to add it. So I was kind of like, come on, Roger, this is the root of the problem. You're using the assets you have to push the Bitcoin cash case, and you're alienating people. So, yeah, it wasn't really a great start, and kind of a bit weird. Um, so when I started the interview, I was firmly on the off-chain scaling 
side of the debate. And nothing in the interview changed my mind about that. I don't believe that long-term Bitcoin Cash can scale effectively. Uh, I just don't believe it. Um, I don't believe on-chain will work. But that isn't from me having this deep technical knowledge. This stuff's really fucking complex. And I've only based my opinion on the technical experience and the technical arguments I've heard from people I trust and respect, like the one I mentioned with Jameson Locke, which I really really recommend you listen to because that for me is the best I've heard so far but I can't sit here I don't build scalable uh, blockchain networks I can't tell you what's going to work and what's not going to work and I don't think many people can and probably the most interesting part for me is when he admitted he was bitter and from that I did try and probe weaknesses from him because the interview started like most where he you know he answered like a politician and funnily enough in prep for my interview I did research on how to interview a politician. And, you know, it was the standard responses. But over time, I kind of felt like I broke him down a little bit on that and got him to open up a little bit and kind of admit some mistakes and admit some weaknesses. I personally think there's a long way to go on that. And I actually think the way he approaches things is counterproductive for what he's trying to achieve. And also, outside of the interview, I did have a long chat with him about Russ Albrecht, because Lynn was on the show, and Roger's friends with them, and has donated uh, to their legal case. And it was a very different side to him, you know, a very personal side, which I've never noticed before. So I'm not going to just record this and pretend I don't like him for any reason, because I've got no reason to dislike him. He was only nice to me, and I got on really well with him. But I'm just not keen on the, you know, the Bitcoin cash, Roger. So, listen, look, I've, I've gone on a bit here. I do hope you enjoy the interview. I do hope you understand that I've challenged him on the things I feel comfortable with. And I do hope you can kind of put your, uh, maybe put your personal opinions on one side and just listen to the interview for what it is. As I said, you know, there's nothing in this interview that's made me support Bitcoin Cash anymore. Um, but it did make me see Roger probably more as a person. And, you know, because behind every person, you know, who's in this space, there is a human there, you know, who's trying to get by and trying to do what they think is right. And I, I genuinely believe he thinks what he's doing is right, just why, you know, so many people disagreeing with him. So, listen, I hope you enjoy the interview. As ever, feel free to get in touch. You can tweet me. You can drop me an email. My email is hello at whatbitcoindid.com. I hope you respect why I did the interview. If you didn't, well, there's nothing I can do about that. Anyway, let's move on to the interview. Hi, Roger. Thanks for having me here in Tokyo. Thank you for coming to Tokyo. This is my first visit. Welcome. Um, you've been here since 2006, right? Yeah, that's right. Long time. 12 years. What has it attracted you to the place and why have you stayed here? Oh, it's a great place. Friendly people, great food. It's wonderful, right? What's not to like? You've only been here for a day or so, but uh, what's your impression so far? Friendly, safe, clean, nice, right? Everyone is so friendly. Uh, everything is clean. Everything's nice. Uh, not great for a vegetarian. That's probably my only difficulty so far is the food. But I, Actually, I think there's lots of great vegetarian food in, in Japan. I think you just need to up your Japanese language skills to I appreciate it. it so. um, thank you for having me here. Um, great to meet you finally. I've got a lot of questions for you. I, I've got a lot of notes as well. It's really interesting trying to research this because there is so much i, I kind of put a list of everything that, that I, I had there was history block size scaling white papers economic censorship mining empty mining blocks full, there's so much and i think all these interviews have already been done with you uh, in my show notes i'm going to put in the interviews with richard hart with samson mount economy people can see those i think i want to approach things slightly differently um and try and understand a bit more about how things are going with the Bitcoin Cash project, but also I want to understand a bit more about your motivations personally. So as somebody who got into Bitcoin seriously about a year and a half ago, uh, I read Digital Gold and I read about this guy, Roger Veer. Seemed like a really cool guy. Seen some of your videos. And then all this shit's happened since. So can you give us an update on how the Bitcoin Cash project is going? And, and then I'll ask you some more things. So uh, the Bitcoin Cash project is going amazingly well. Uh, actually, I woke up this morning to check the latest news, and there's a text messaging app called YeChat, I believe, with 33 million users that's building in uh, Bitcoin Cash right there. So like, once that's live, I think pretty clearly Bitcoin Cash will have more potential users with the app installed than Bitcoin Core at that point. So Bitcoin Cash is having positive adoption around the world and growing numbers of transactions and growing numbers of exchanges and growing everything, whereas Bitcoin Core is sadly having negative uh, merchant adoption where businesses that used to accept Bitcoin Core 
have stopped accepting Bitcoin Core, and that's happening with not just one or two businesses, but lots of businesses, and not just small businesses, but great big giant businesses that used to accept Bitcoin Core have stopped doing so. Where, where, where are your motivations driven from on this in terms of what you're trying to achieve with Bitcoin Cash? Sometimes I see, I see things which seem to come from your libertarian background, but then I also see things which come from your you know, successful business person. Where are you, where are you motivated? Uh, all of my motivations for this come from my libertarian, voluntarist, self-ownership background, where I think each individual should have 100% complete control over their own life and their own money and their own destiny. And Bitcoin Cash, I think, is the best tool the world has to enable that at the moment. Uh, I wish the Bitcoin Core supporters good luck with their project. Um, but I don't think it's the best tool the world has to achieve more personal liberty and personal economic freedom and more more economic freedom for the world. I think I think Bitcoin Cash is the best tool the world has to achieve those goals at this point. But if it's something else, I would gladly get behind that other project as well. Um, there's obviously been one hell of a scaling debate and argument for the last two years. You've obviously been attacked a lot for your opinions. Does it all get a bit tiring? No, it doesn't get tiring because uh, how often does a tool come along that, in the form of cryptocurrencies especially, but how often does a tool like that come along that has the ability to change the entire world for the better? And not just for one or two people in like first world countries, but for literally every single person on the planet. So uh, no, I, I don't get tired of that. So you're happy to keep having the argument, having the fights, the conflict. Does this not detract away from the work you want to do on Bitcoin Cash? I, I think the fights and the arguments are, are done and over at this point. Uh, all the people are busy building tools and infrastructure on top of Bitcoin Cash, and the Bitcoin Core people are busy arguing, oh, you're stealing our brand, but go and read the white paper. Uh, it's very clear that the white paper is describing Bitcoin Cash. It's not describing Bitcoin Core. But it, it, it feels like in every question I ask, ask you, you have a um, you're promoting Bitcoin Cash, but you can't do it without a negative slant on Bitcoin Core. And it's therefore it feels like you are still in the debate. And I, I, I wanted to myself like, what is the end goal here? Do you want uh, Bitcoin to burn to the ground and and die off, or do you not see actually this is a live split test about two approaches to scaling? We yet to see evidence, full evidence, long term. We've got historical evidence, but future evidence of which one will be right. I, th I think all the historical evidence shows that Bitcoin Core's path is the wrong one. Uh, as soon as the blocks became full, it started losing market adoption. It started losing market share. It started losing all the characteristics that made it useful to the world as money. And Bitcoin Cash still has all those characteristics. And that's why we're seeing so many people jump ship from being involved in Bitcoin Core to Bitcoin Cash. So it's not that I'm attacking Bitcoin Core. I'm just trying to point out to the entire world that Bitcoin Cash is better money than Bitcoin Core. And Bitcoin Cash is a better chance at providing more economic freedom for the world than Bitcoin Core. So if you're in this and involved because you want to see more economic freedom for the world, Bitcoin Cash is a better tool to achieve that than Bitcoin Core. And that's not to say that I'm attacking Bitcoin Core. It's just like saying that, uh, you know, water is a healthier drink than, than Coca-Cola. That's not attacking Coca-Cola. It's just a factual statement that Bitcoin Cash is better money than Bitcoin Core. At present, it is better in terms of uh, speed and cost, especially back when fees were $30 in December. I've heard you talk about that. It's over, the average fee at one point was over $50. And if you were running any sort of business, you were regularly paying over $1,000 in fees for a single Bitcoin transaction. Which, you know, uh, we talked about this before we started. Uh, I didn't see any harm in a short-term um, increase in the block size to keep fees down because that would have been useful, especially for any retailers who had adopted it. It felt, felt like a backward step. At the same time... 10 years down the line, we don't know whether uh, large blocks, you know, we don't know what size blocks will be needed in 10 years' time. We don't know if large blocks will be the most efficient path, or we don't know if side chains will be. It could be either. And so I agree that we don't know. So we have two options to figure out what the correct block size is. One option is to have a, a small group of people decide, here's what the block size is going to be because we said so. Or the Bitcoin Cash option is to let the market decide what the appropriate amount of block size to be produced is. And for anybody that studied economics, you realize that uh, the market is, is going to be a, provide a more efficient outcome than uh, a bunch of central planners deciding one megabyte is, is the end-all, be-all be size when it comes to block size. But Bitcoin is not going to go away and Bitcoin Cash is not going to go away. 
I've listened to all of the arguments. I've listened to both sides. And it feels to me like uh, the route to, you know, somebody who doesn't have the experience. Look, it, one thing that's very tricky for new people coming into Bitcoin is that they're encouraged to learn and understand the tech and get behind it. And I fully encourage that. Use, use all of the different cryptocurrencies and see which ones work the best for you. But they're encouraged to understand. And at the moment, you know, we're not, we're, we're not all Jimmy Song. We're not all Jameson Lott. We're not all Roger Veer. We're not, we've not all been here for years. We're not all techies. We're not all developers. Yet people, will, leaders in the space talk about wanting millions of people to use it. So we're encouraged to understand. It's very difficult for a new person to come in to understand the difference between Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash. You can go on Reddit. You can go on to our, uh, uh, our BTC and give an opposing argument and be called a fucking idiot. And you can have the, exactly the same on our Bitcoin. So it becomes very difficult. But what happens if you make an opposing argument on our Bitcoin? On, on ETH, on ETH, well, it, it can be deleted. I'm not going to get into the censorship argument because there's no point having a counter argument on either one. Not, not only can it be deleted, it will be deleted on our Bitcoin if, if you propose uh, something positive about Bitcoin Cash. I think, I think that, that deviates from the point because on one, it may get deleted. One, it will get downvoted. But on either side, you just get called a fucking idiot, and you still don't. You still haven't got any anywhere closer to the the truth. And actually, you you're probably better off going to something like our cryptocurrency or crypto markets and asking a question and trying to get as best an impartial view as possible. It's hard to find an impartial view. It's hard to find somebody to help you understand. And therefore, I am wondering to what end and what benefit are all these arguments and fights. Like, who, who, who's helping who here? I think a real big argument that still should be made is that free and open discussion of these ideas are incredibly important. And uh, a huge swath of the Bitcoin core supporting community are openly hostile to the ideas of free speech. And if Bitcoin is supposed to be censorship-resistant money, you shouldn't be engaging in a bunch of censorship online to, to, to further those ends. Because are we talking about our Bitcoin Themos? We're talking about our Bitcoin Themos. Uh, so for anyone who doesn't understand the background to Themos... Because I don't. What is the background here? So um, for anybody that doesn't understand the background, I think a really great place to start would be go on Google and Google Bitcoin censorship. And there's maybe two, there's at least two, maybe three articles by John Block. Are they the ones on Medium? And they're on Medium and yep. they outline the censorship that, that's been going on in the Bitcoin ecosystem there. And it's jaw-dropping. It's not just like deleting posts, but they'll literally selectively delete posts where let's say there's what the first post and the first post says, I think such and such. And the second post says, you're wrong because of whatever reasons. And then the third post replying to the second says, I agree. And so, and then they'll delete the middle post. So it looks like the person's saying, I agree. And they leave the post that says, I agree. So it looks like he's agreeing to the exact opposite of what he's actually agreeing to. And that's been caught red-handed going on on our Bitcoin. And it's just absolutely disgusting if, if you think Bitcoin it should be censorship-resistant money. Of course, but Reddit is a toxic place anyway. It is an I think censorship makes it toxic. I think it's uh, try. I think Twitter is a much better place to go and have a debate. I think it's uh, much more open minded. I think as you are tend to be not everyone, but most people tend to use their proper name and photos. There's a bit more integrity around it. I think I don't use Reddit anymore. I just I just got fed up of the pointless arguments and the back and forth. I got. I so what I used to do occasionally, I would create a post and I would put it on RBTC and on R Bitcoin and just see the different reactions. And I've been called a fucking idiot on both of them so many times. I just gave up. So I, I just don't see any healthy debate there. And also, whilst you claim their censorship, and I wouldn't argue against it, I don't think you struggle to get your voice across because the flip side to so if I can interject there, so I, I don't have any problem getting my voice across at all. But I'm the CEO of Bitcoin.com, and you know the world's first investor in Bitcoin startup. So of course I'm able to get my voice across. But what about the other thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of other people who want to be able to participate on our Bitcoin, who aren't the CEO of Bitcoin.com, and just have their posts deleted or have their accounts banned? Those people are not able to have their voice heard because of the censorship. For me, though, do you know what it is? It's kind of like, I can think of two examples. So if you go to a soccer match in England, I hate calling it soccer, but you go to a soccer match in England, we're in opposing ends, the fans, right? You've got, say, Tottenham against Arsenal. You put a Tottenham fan in the Arsenal end saying how great Tottenham are, they're all going to call him a fucking idiot. And that's the problem. I think with our BTC and our Bitcoin, most people in there have kind of made up their mind. 
So it's kind of it's I, I although the censorship exists, I don't think it's to the detriment of uh, people find out information anymore. I think all the information's out there. And I would say on the flip side, you also the Bitcoin Cash community has the advantage of using the Bitcoin.com domain and at Bitcoin on Twitter to push their own argument forward, and which isn't always impartial. So we should, I'd, I'd like to talk a little bit about the at Bitcoin Twitter account. So a lot of people have speculated that I bought it, that it's me. Uh, none of that's true. Uh, but I do know who the owner of that account is. It's someone that's been involved in Bitcoin since 2009 and supports Bitcoin Cash. because is it Bitcoin, Satoshi? Uh, it's not Satoshi. Um, but it, it's, it's somebody that, that people who have been around Bitcoin for a while, they'd recognize his name. And uh, he saw the way I've been viciously attacked for simply saying that, that Bitcoin should continue to be Bitcoin and that the Bitcoin Cash version of Bitcoin has continued to be Bitcoin and the Bitcoin Core version is now something else. And he watched the way that I've been attacked for saying something that I should be allowed to say. And he doesn't want any part of that with his public name associated with it. But uh, Bitcoin Cash, as I made my other recent video, Bitcoin Cash has more Bitcoinness about it than Bitcoin Core does at this point. It could be, people could easily say, that's from your opinion, and that's from the the argument you've created. You know, I I could create a sped, spreadsheet to say why I think Bitcoin is better than Bitcoin Cash, and and create my my so, rules for the spreadsheet. I, I would love to see some people make a spreadsheet as to why they think that Bitcoin Core has more Bitcoinness about it uh, than Bitcoin Cash. And if somebody like Jimmy Song or, or Jameson Lop or or Adam Back or take your even Samson Mao, I'd be more than happy to have a nice civil discussion about it with them. Uh, as well, I think it would be very interesting for both sides of this uh, debate. Um, and again, like I'm not trying to attack Bitcoin Core. I wish them good luck, but I think objectively, Bitcoin Core doesn't have as much Bitcoinness about it as Bitcoin Cash. And I think objectively, Bitcoin Core is not as good a form of money as Bitcoin Cash. So that's not an attack on Bitcoin Core. It's just an objective fact. Just like gold is better money than uh, you know a hunk of iron somewhere. So, <laughs> okay. And I don't disagree that right now, uh, on certain measures, that you could argue Bitcoin Cash is better than Bitcoin as a form of cash. Is it a better technology to scale long term? I don't know. We, we could get into that. But in fairness, would you not admit that you attack Bitcoin? Can you give me an example of, of an attack? Well, anything which you tweet out to dis try and discredit it is an attack. Can you give me one example? Um, well, because you... I guess from my point of view, I, I don't see them as attacks. I see them as objective statements that Bitcoin Core doesn't work as well as money as Bitcoin Cash. Uh, the fees are higher on Bitcoin Core. The transactions are slower. Um, Lightning Network doesn't exist yet uh, in any sort of usable way for commerce. Um, I don't see these as attacks any more than saying that uh, you know a, a golden life vest doesn't work as well as a life vest made out of styrofoam. It's not an attack on gold. It's just yeah, but talking equally, about the differences. I guess equally, some people could come back and say Bitcoin Cash is, is more centralized, or Bitcoin Cash is um, about to have patents on it by Craig Wright, which is not really great for open source. Like, there's always a vector which you can pick to to attack. It does feel like you know from my from where I'm coming from that there is a bitterness towards. Bitcoin. So I, I, tell I agree. You, I, there's, there's a lot of bitterness, but uh, I think the reason the bitterness exists is because there's a Bitcoin that was outlined in the white paper, and that Bitcoin name has been usurped by the Bitcoin core supporters at this point for a system that doesn't even remotely resemble the Bitcoin that was described in the original Bitcoin white paper. So that's a bitterness you feel? Well, of course. Yeah. So, so I, f I think that bitterness comes across. And well, I, I think I have good reason to be better on that front. So people used a bunch of censorship and propaganda and lies to, to divert the entire Bitcoin project into something that wasn't described in the original Bitcoin white paper. And then they claimed that the Bitcoin Cash project, that's still very similar to the original Bitcoin described in the original Bitcoin white paper, they had the audacity to claim that we're trying to steal the Bitcoin brand, when in fact it's the exact opposite. Well, so the brand thing is an interesting point because... When did you start calling it Bitcoin Core? After the fork happened. Too. There used to be one and one Bitcoin only. And then so, on August 1st, that single Bitcoin BTC split into two versions of Bitcoin. Bitcoin Core that managed to retain the ticker symbol BTC and Bitcoin Cash that uh, has the ticker symbol BCH. But you, weren't, you were calling it Bitcoin SegWit at first. 
I think some other people were. I, I don't know if I did. Oh, I, yeah, no, I, you did. I watched a bunch of videos last I night. Think that, that, <laughs> yeah. that perhaps I have. And... What, I, what I think is that that is a conscious decision because the and, – and this is – I'm not having a go at you, but look – from an outsider, you're welcome to have a go. No, you won't no, be no. the first time. No, no. Because so. I don't think that like, everyone's done that. You know, you know, uh, John. I've watched John Carvalho and his interview with you, and I think you know you both probably regret parts of that. But he was trying to wind you up. I'm not going to. People are going to attack me after this and say, "Why didn't you have a go at Roger? Why didn't you? I, I don't need to." But what I what I will do is stand by things that I, I firmly believe. I think there's a hypocrisy in calling it Bitcoin Core. When you get upset and people call Bitcoin Cash B Cash, which I, I, I'm I'm using in my statement, but I'm do not going to refer to as that. Do you see the? And, and just so people know, that's not what got me riled up with John Carvalho. Well, no, it was the sock puppet. But also, a, you do get upset. People call it B Cash. Oh, I, of course, I don't like it. And the reason they're doing that actually, so there was a whole. There's another fantastic article. If anybody goes and Google's, like, why do people call Bitcoin Cash B Cash? There's mm-hmm. another article I think on Medium as well. Mm-hmm. It was a whole social media manipulation campaign where a bunch of Bitcoin Core supporters went and registered our Bcash on Reddit and some Bcash domain names and this and that and tried to divert everybody into calling Bitcoin Cash Bcash because it strips away the Bitcoin name of Bitcoin Cash. And so if we go out on the street here in front of you know the office here in Tokyo and ask people on the street, hey, have you heard of Bitcoin? They'll say, of course. If you ask them, have you heard of Bcash? They'll say, no, I've never heard of that. And so it was an intentional attempt by Bitcoin core supporters to make sure that Bitcoin Cash wasn't able to have any of the Bitcoin branding associated with it after the split and basically undo all the work and effort that so many Bitcoin Cash supporters did from, you know, 2009 until the split promoting Bitcoin in general. Bitcoin Core managed to take most of that public goodwill with it by by retaining the BTC ticker symbol. And so now we're having to play catch up on that front. And uh, so it's definitely an intentional effort on my part to call Bitcoin Core, Bitcoin Core, and call Bitcoin Cash, Bitcoin Cash, because I don't think that it's fair for Bitcoin Core to be the only version of Bitcoin with Bitcoin in the name. Well, okay, so there's a couple of points on that. Firstly, in, it's not an entirely just a social media c- campaign. Actually, there's some people like myself who genuinely think Bcash sounds kind of cool. I'm not, that's the only time I'm going to refer to that. I'm not here to wind I'm, up. I'm, I'm not but I actually, actually think that's kind of a cool name. And in hindsight... I understand why you and want to keep I, Bitcoin in I, I it, but it's agree. kind of cool. If, if, if Bitcoin had never existed and Bitcoin wasn't known by hundreds of millions of people or billions of people around the world at this point, and you wanted to start some brand new currency, uh, Bcash would be a just fine name, but, but that's not where we're at today. No, of course. But then you have to accept, if, there is a, if you're accusing a social campaign of renaming it to discredit it and, and take the Bitcoin name away, it is hypocritical then to rename Bitcoin Bitcoin Core because... Nobody else calls it that. Let's, let's, be, let's be fair. We go on Coinbase or any exchange, it's Bitcoin. Bitcoin.com calls it that. And that's a pretty popular website. Who owns Bitcoin.com? I do. Well, there you go. And, so and, and, and to be there's, fair... There's no I, argument there. Well, I, I, don't want to give, I don't want to give names so these people don't get hate, but the idea for it came from one of the major, major, major Bitcoin businesses in the world. And they're the ones who presented the idea to me. And they said that maybe they will be doing the same thing as well. So maybe we'll see some more businesses doing that exact same thing. But this, therefore, is not For me, this is an attack. As as much as calling Bitcoin Cash B Cash is an attack because, because so well, hold on, hold on. By calling Bit the BTC version of Bitcoin by calling it Bitcoin Core, mm-hmm. that doesn't strip away its Bitcoinness in the name. It was calling the BCH version of Bitcoin, calling it B Cash, that strips away its Bitcoinness. Do you know what I think it does? I think it harms both sides. Tell me why. I think it's counterproductive, and the confusion is counterproductive to both sides. Firstly essentially now we have three if we ignore all the other shitty little bitcoins we now have three bitcoins we have bitcoin and bitcoin core which are the same thing and we have bitcoin cash and that's a problem for new people coming in or people who don't understand and it creates confusion whereas if we have bitcoin and bitcoin cash we just have the two but it's by creating the confusion you also is counterproductive to bitcoin cash because if people don't understand which one's which, they don't understand which yours is. Well, I'm, I'm not too worried about that in the long run, because as soon as people actually try using either one, they'll realize that Bitcoin Cash is the more useful version of the two. That's a fair argument in the short term based on block size. But if you create... It's okay for you. Look, you're a rich guy. You're very successful. Made a lot of money. People have lost money in the confusion, right? 
I don't think anybody has, actually. You I don't I, think a single person has uh, um, sent money from uh, to the wrong wallet or maybe recently bought Bitcoin cash on Bitcoin.com thinking it was Bitcoin. You don't think that's happened at all? Because I can show I can't get it now, but I could easily email you proof afterwards. I, I know it has happened. I don't think anybody has, to be honest. Um, I think it's a bunch of people lying on the internet claiming that that's happened. So, for example, in our Bitcoin.com wallet that supports both Bitcoin Core and Bitcoin Cash, the address formats are different. So it's impossible to send Bitcoin Core from our buy.bitcoin.com website. It's impossible for them to actually accidentally send that to the Bitcoin there, Cash address. There are other instances, address. other wallets where you could. But I, I would say, I, look, I'll be fair with you if you're fair with me. I would say if to say there's not been a single instance of somebody sending Bitcoin to Bitcoin Cash or vice versa, I, I, I think is not fair. I think it, it must have happened. With, with how many people there are in the world, that's probably happened somewhere. But I, I don't think it happened because of a, mis- a confusion between the names Bitcoin Core and Bitcoin Cash. I think it's just there's lots of addresses floating around and lots of people doing lots of things. And even, even I, I think I've sent some Bitcoin Core to a cash address or the other way around before before they had different address formats. Right. Um, so, and, you know, I, I, I definitely qualify as an experienced cryptocurrency user. And even I've, yeah, I've done that. But, but the, the money wasn't lost. It's just sitting at the other address and still perfectly claimable. But uh, our website's very, very clear. Um, between you know, the differences between Bitcoin Core and Bitcoin Cash. And we have big giant that blog That wasn't posts. entirely true last week. Uh, so I think that we have entire articles on the website, and we have we have almost 100 people working yeah, at Bitcoin.com. You know what I'm referring to. Like, we're referring to our Block Explorer, we're referred to Bitcoin Cash as just Bitcoin, parentheses, yeah. BCH. That and was then, obviously a conscious decision. I think it was a conscious decision by the person that managed that part of the website, yeah. Yeah. And so maybe in the future... But who, who, uh, you can't probably name that person, right? You don't want to expose them. I don't want to throw them but, under the bus. But somebody, so, but, somebody within this building made that decision. Uh, physically, they're not in the building. All right. to, uh, but somebody on the team but, made that decision. Sure. How, yeah. how, did they, how are they able to make that decision without somebody approving it? Well, somebody has to approve it, and I don't approve every single last thing. So this person had uh, had access to that part of the website. And to be honest, I, I don't You had no knowledge of it happening? I, I had knowledge after it happened. I didn't know until it was already live okay. on the website, and people started complaining about it on the Internet. And then they made a Telegram chat group talking about how they're going to sue Bitcoin.com. And they had some people in there that were scouring every inch of our website looking for inconsistencies where people might confuse Bitcoin Cash and Bitcoin Core which was actually fantastic for us because we had several people in that Telegram group watching all the stuff that they found, like, oh, great, let's fix this, let's fix that. So we had like, you know, a whole bunch of people doing quality uh, assurance testing on our website so we could go and fix all these little layers. So, for example, there was one page that was talking about Bitcoin Cash and there was an image of a guy holding the phone, but the, the image on the phone was of a Bitcoin Core wallet. So we changed that image yeah, yeah. And, and we changed all these things that they pointed out to us. So we were actually very thankful and happy that we had so many people scouring every inch of our website looking for, for mistakes. Which because is cool. When you have a big website, mistakes happen. Yeah, so. I understand. My background is web development. I've then managed you know. big, I've managed big web projects, but I also I also understand that like something of that level doesn't happen by accident. I think it was a very conscious decision yeah. on the part of the person that was in charge of that part of the website. Yeah, and I don't disagree. Or I don't dispute that for for one instant. And then previously, I've seen you admit like you. You don't employ sock puppets. I'm not going to accuse you, but Thank you. somebody. If, if you do accuse me of that, uh, no, th- then I will get riled up. So. I've, I've flown 13 hours. I don't want you to rage quit this. <laughs> um, but you have also admitted you've had staff members who have done that and they've been disciplined. So, isn't uh, there always seems to be an opportunity to blame somebody else or 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 divert blame for things that are happening? But I think potentially one of the problems is is there's maybe a culture of of creating confusion and in the belief that it, by creating the confusion that would be good for bitcoin cash but i like i say i think it's bad for both sides i think i want less confusion also if you that's why we built a whole website explaining the differences between bitcoin core and bitcoin cash so um i agree that sometimes people get confused and sometimes it's confusing when people you know write things on one part of the website that aren't consistent with other parts of the website that's that's a problem uh, my end goal is to to minimize the amount of confusion in the world do you think if bitcoin.com was managed by an independent party who had no affiliation to either side the website and the app would be designed as it is now I think Bitcoin Core should be managed by an independent uh, third party. Uh, I'm sorry, Bitcoin Org, Bitcoin.org. 
but that one certainly isn't. But that's either, not the question so. I asked. Okay, so. so the question I asked, we, we can we can talk about anything. You can ask me any questions afterwards. But my question to you is, if Bitcoin.com, which is the domain of Bitcoin, and you know we have multiple Bitcoins, but if that was designed by managed by an independent third party with no affiliation, do you think the design of the website and the design of the app would be as they are now? No, of course not. Okay. If it was designed by a different Bitcoin Cash supporter, it would be totally different though as well. So every everybody has different. Yeah, but I'm on about views. if. Because you've talked about the censorship on our, our Bitcoin, but at the same time, at the flip side, you do have assets to use to, to your advantage, which, if there had been no split, would be used for Bitcoin. So it kind of works both ways, right? So I, I poured my heart and soul into promoting Bitcoin every every way I possibly mm-hmm. could from 2011. And you said you read the book, Digital Gold. Yeah. Like anybody that's read that book, I, I don't think can question my devotion to no, bringing... your, your money you put into advertising, promoting... You know, I think a lot of people who haven't been in the space long enough don't realize about that. But really, you sh- sh- Bitcoin isn't you. You don't no. own Bitcoin. No. You own the domain. But really, shouldn't the domain be impartial? Uh, so .com stands for commerce or commercial, right? So .bitcoin.com is a commercial website with a goal to earn money. And because we're earning money, we're able to employ almost 100 people at this point and, uh, and still growing. Um, so I don't think it needs to be impartial. I think it, it can be just fine running its business, just like PayPal.com is not impartial in regards to describing or using PayPal. Uh, Bitcoin.com doesn't need to be impartial in, in regards to describing or using Bitcoin. And from my point of view, Bitcoin Cash is the, the best tool the world has ever seen to achieve more economic freedom. And more economic freedom uh, means less babies will die around the world. And I've seen a lot of people mocking me for that. But like, yeah, that's but a real on. thing, too. Yeah, but you, you, is this like... Um Appealing to altruism, you know, it's... it's <laughs> no, it's appealing to my own self-interest because I want to live in a better world too. So oh, no, I, I get that. I want to live in a better world. But come on, like, you've probably got more money than, than any of us will ever see in our life. And if you if that halved today, you would still be fine. It would make no, no difference to your life. So why don't you just go and give half your money away straight away? You know, I don't... I don't, I don't, I don't buy so, so, so that So that actually shows... Another thing that I think a lot of people that haven't studied economics deeply don't realize, so like, let, let's say I have a, you know, a million bitcoins, right, worth however many billions of dollars that is at the moment. Um, if I do absolutely nothing with them, that actually helps the world's economy the most because I have all this capital that I didn't deploy like at all. And that means that all the existing physical goods in the world get to be deployed for other things that other people want. So like, let's say I go and earn, you know, millions of dollars and I have the pieces of paper. If I then go and light them on fire in, in my backyard, the rest of the world uh, is that much wealthier because I no longer have a claim on those resources. So if I'm not using any of the bitcoins or if I destroy them, the rest of the world still has all the physical wealth out there that could be used for, for other things. So... I, I don't understand what you just said there at all. I, just, I don't understand what that means. Um, so if you maybe don't I can spend, explain it a little, a little if bit. If you don't spend money, the, the world is a better place. Surely if you spend money on making the world a better place, it's been a better place. So I'll, I'll give you a, maybe a, a more concise example. So like inflation is caused by printing money. If, if there's, let's say there's a million units of currency in the yeah. world and the government goes and prints a million more units, then suddenly all the units that you had in your pocket are worth half as much. But let's say there's a million units of currency in the world and I own 100,000 of them or 10% and they're in my pocket and I light them on fire. Suddenly now all the units of currency that you have left in your pocket are worth more because the units that I had are never going to be out into circulation. That's not, going to, that's not going to trickle down. If you're talking about babies dying, that's not going to trickle down to make any difference. If- no, but more economic freedom will. And more people being able to engage in commerce and trade with other people around the world raises the rate of economic growth around the world. And that means fewer babies will die at childbirth. That data is very, very, very clear. And it's very frustrating when I hear like Bitcoin core supporters mock that sort of idea. But more economic freedom leads to a higher standard of living for everybody. And a higher standard of living means fewer babies will die. Um, it's, yeah. it's just that simple. Uh, I don't and think it, people not, disagree with the the the, the and it's not specific, economics, but it's I just, not specific to Bitcoin Cash either. It's just economic freedom in general. I think what people tend to think, Mark, I think the pre, the people, the reason people are mocking you for it is, it's almost like I think it's because they haven't studied economics, no, but they no, don't no, realize no, that no. that's not the. That I don't that's think the that's why people are mocking. I think people are mocking because they're like, how fucking ridiculous is this that we're having a debate about scaling and the argument is now about babies are dying. So for because me, the, the debate isn't about scaling. The debate is bringing as much economic freedom to the world as quickly as we possibly can. Hmm. And the scaling debate has delayed the, 
the, the rate of adoption of cryptocurrencies around the world and delayed the rate of economic growth around the world because mm. we've had less economic freedom because less cryptocurrencies have been adopted around the world. No, l- listen, I, I, don't, I don't disagree with wanting to roll out cryptocurrencies. What I'm saying is, is when you come out with an argument that babies are dying, you're basically saying, agree with me, otherwise you're a baby killer. And that's just, it's a fucking pointless argument. We don't get anywhere because... And then, so you, you you trap us in a corner. Or, or if you don't support point. economic freedom, you're a baby killer, plain and simple. I'll say it just that clearly. If you don't support more economic freedom, you are a baby killer. But when you connect your if, vision if you to that, to, to baby killing, you're basically saying, agree with me, or you're a baby killer. No, that, no, no, that, no. That, you, you, can disagree one, you can disagree one step ahead. You can say that I don't think that the path that Roger is advocating for Bitcoin Cash leads to more economic freedom as quickly as the Bitcoin core roadmap. And you can say all of us want more babies to, to survive childbirth and everybody to have a higher standard of living, but the policies that Roger is advocating in Bitcoin Cash don't lead to more economic freedom. The policies that Bitcoin Core is advocating do lead to more economic freedom. You can make that mm-hmm. argument. I think everybody wants fewer babies to die at childbirth. Of like, so I'm not saying that you're a baby killer if you support Bitcoin Core. I will say that you're a baby killer. You're making if the you... leap, though. No. Well, I, I am trying to make an argument that Bitcoin Cash leads to more economic freedom for the world than Bitcoin Core does. And if you want to disagree, I'm more than happy to have an argument. Not not you personally, yeah, like yeah. Any, anybody I in know. general. Um, and I, I will listen to those arguments. And if you convince me that Bitcoin Core is going to bring more economic freedom to the world and more economic growth to the world better than Bitcoin Cash will, I'll become a, a big giant Bitcoin Core supporter once again. I just I think it's a very narrow way of looking at it. And I think I think you one of my issues is therefore I think you alienate people from from the debate. I think you it's counterproductive for what you're trying to achieve with Bitcoin Cash because it's it, <laughs> If no one will disagree that economic freedom uh, leads to better, uh, you know, better opportunity, better healthcare, uh, you know, but but to to make the leap from uh, my approach to scaling is is uh, it's better for Bitcoin, which will create more economic freedom, which less babies will die. You, you're just making the leap, which traps people, and it's just it's fucking ridiculous. Well, I'll ask you: Do you think hundred dollar fees or thousand dollar fees for on chain transactions is people like uh, you know Adam Back are advocating for Bitcoin Core? Do you think that'll lead to more or less economic freedom for the world? Well, let's come back to that. I'll, I'll answer that. I, I answered I your last question well, no, because, after you called me like okay. on it. Okay. But now I, it's my so turn. actually, I listened to the Jameson Lop interview and. I find the whole optimization of block space really interesting. And having heard so many different debates about block, you know, block sizes and scaling, that was the first time when I really felt like, actually, do you know what? This guy's right. The, the couple of points that Jameson brought up, which I thought that really nailed it for me, the first one was there will come, you know, I'm a miner, block rewards are going to half in. Um, uh, was it June 20, 2020? Yeah. And, you know, that's if the prices haven't gone up, that's going to impact us. And in four years' time, half again. So there's going to come to the point whereby if the value hasn't gone up, the mining rewards are going to become very important. Therefore, if mining fees are, are close to zero, there aren't enough transactions, mining is going to be not going to be as profitable. There might be less miners, which means a less secure network. So actually, I buy into the view that uh, fees within a fee market is good because it supports the miners, Right. As long as there is a, a, a good functioning a, a second layer network for cheap lower fees for uh, smaller payments, right? So I, I get all that within my limited knowledge. Um, so my, my issue is right now is the where I am on, on your side is that in the short term we've taken a backward step by not just increasing the block size. I think we could have easily gone to two megabytes, kept the fees down. Increase the block size as needed to keep the fees down over the period where second layer um, technology is being developed. And once they're in place and proven, we then can let's use them. them. And we could have even gone as far as, what, I mean, Luke, Luke, Luke Dash Judith thinks 300. Who knows what we need? Nobody, you, you don't know, I don't know. I certainly think if this is a global currency that's used millions of times every day uh, by millions of people, I can't see how on chain scaling. Is the best idea. I think it's. I think it's a combination of the two. I, I'm in the I middle. I completely agree. No, it is a combination of the two, but the second layer solutions weren't ready yet, and the Bitcoin Core people intentionally strangled the. Oh, so you don't have one. any issue with the second no, layer? No, I'm. I'm. I'm just fine, and I think that's another big misconception that's been 
you know, propagated on the internet, whether intentionally or through censorship or just through bad communication yeah, on, yeah. on the Bitcoin cash side of people. But like, we have no problem with layer two stuff at all. Uh, in fact, we're big fans of it, but we're saying don't strangle layer one before layer two is ready yet. And unfortunately, that's exactly what happened. And it's easier for people to switch from Bitcoin to altcoins than it was for people to switch from Bitcoin to Lightning Network or layer two stuff. And that's exactly what wound up happening. It's funny, I, I kept a list of things which I agree with and disagree with. So I've got things I agree with on you. I've also got some things I disagree with. And one thing I completely disagree with as a trader is that the Bitcoin dominance argument that you put across, that the Bitcoin dominance dropped because the blocks were full. I think it completely... Uh, Do you think it was it, just coincidence? Or? No, I think entrepreneurial spirit. Look, you know, where, 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 where are the primary places that Bitcoin has lost dominance to? I'm sorry, where what, what are the what all coins is Bitcoin? Ethereum, of course. Ethereum? But yeah. not just Ethereum? Where else? Ethereum, Dash, Dash? Litecoin. Any more? Yep. Probably Monero and Zcash too. Ripple? And some Ripple too, yeah. You invested in Ripple? Yep. Okay. You completely forget the argument of entrepreneurial spirit and that people want to do their own things. I believe that most there were there were coins being created back in 2013. And none of them got any traction until Bitcoin's blocks became full. Well, actually. In fairness, Litecoin got a bit of traction when it was seen as the secondary option to Bitcoin. Honestly, I, I meet people all the time. Very, very few people are transacting with cryptocurrencies. I pay my mining fees with it. I bought my mining equipment with it. Um, I pay some of my staff with it. And that's about it. But from day to day... Which I, cryptocurrency are you using for all those things? Well, I use Bitcoin Cash for my mining equipment because I had to. And actually, it was quite a cool experience. Well, actually, no... It was a really nerve-wracking experience sending two hundred thousand dollars to a string characters and just it waiting. Sent it away on the internet. What's yeah. the biggest you've ever done? A lot. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. do you still get that moment of? Yeah, I still I still double check the addresses yeah. a little bit carefully. Yeah. So, so uh, I've used Bitcoin Cash for that for my mining fees and um, my um, electricity costs. I pay in Bitcoin, and I just have a preference. Um, so what, what do you think about the arguments so like for people that are doing Bitcoin mining, when the fees become like $50 for a single transaction, the Bitcoin network, it squeezes out the individual miners or the small time miners because the network fee winds up becoming such a big percentage of the amount of Bitcoin that they're able to earn each day. And it, it incentivizes big giant mining companies because $50 for one transaction on if you mine $5,000 worth of Bitcoin isn't such a big deal. Whereas if you only mined, you know, $100 for the whole week worth of Bitcoin and the fee is going to be $50 to withdraw that. I think that, it's a real shame. And I think it's that's part of a capitalist society. It's no different from going to a high street, a normal high street and seeing small businesses being edged out because they can't afford the rent. Well, Bitcoin Cash doesn't have that problem with the low fees. So individual miners with just one single you know, S9 in their bedroom at home can still mine on Bitcoin Cash, and the fees yeah, aren't a problem but, but there. But I, I can mine one S9 at the moment with Bitcoin, and because, it's fine. Because the Bitcoin transactions on Bitcoin Core are like an all-time low for the last two years because fewer people are using Bitcoin than they Well, yeah, but there's counter-arguments to that. And we, we've jumped around, but there's counter-arguments to that in that it's, you know, People, you know, uh, exchanges have become more efficient in batching transactions, which degrades the privacy that people have with their bitcoins. Yeah, well, which hurts the fungibility of get, bitcoin. This is where we go around because Bitcoin Cash um, affected privacy because people had to expose their wallets to receive their Bitcoin Cash. We can we go around in circles. Let's go back to let's. We're not going to achieve anything by jumping back and forth. Let's go back to the Bitcoin dominance argument. I believe, even if there, we'd had a, a block size increase, Bitcoin dominance would have fallen because there is an incentive to create altcoins and there is an incentive to create tokens and there's an incentive to, to create other uh, 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 pro projects. I think many of these projects would have, you know, once the exchanges started launching and, and having all these different currencies and tokens to trade and the opportunity to speculate. I mean, you've invested in some, right? Yep. Why, why did you invest in Ripple? Uh, so I invested in Ripple, I think, back in 2011 or 12. I actually put up the seed money to start yep. Ripple. Um, and the idea at the time was that we could make a version of Bitcoin that didn't require mining. And the price of Bitcoin at the time of my investment in Ripple was like, I don't know, $1 or $2, maybe $3. I know it's it an alternate much. use case, right? No. No, the idea for Ripple was to have Bitcoin. But it's an altcoin. It is an altcoin, yeah. but the idea for it was to have Bitcoin that didn't require mining because, my, uh, according to the original you know, creator of, of Ripple, uh, mining was wasteful and we can do it without needing mining. And but it's an altcoin. 
You, sure. Um, as I understand, you created, you invest in Dash? I, I own some Dash, yeah, but I, I didn't buy any Dash at all. So the only altcoin I had ever owned, ever, until much more recently, was, was Ripple when I put up the money to help start it when Bitcoin didn't have any traction. There was, I don't think there was BitPay yet. Like, uh, there wasn't really any any commercial traction really for, for Bitcoin yet. Um, I didn't buy any altcoins at all until I became scared about Bitcoin scalability and the blocks becoming full. And that's what made me decide to diversify into some altcoins. And like the amount of Dash that I own is very, very, very small. But come on, come on, listen. Outside of you, everybody wants to make money. Everybody wants the opportunity. Everyone wants to be as rich as Roger Veer. Everybody wants to have, be wealthy and just improve their lives. Sure. And economic freedom helps everybody do that across the globe. Which we've covered. But with altcoins... It, People I, feel like they're getting a second chance at, get, a, yeah. at picking a winner. Yeah, sure. of course they are. So sure. I just think the, every time I hear you talk about Bitcoin's dominant, do you honestly believe Bitcoin would be at 90% dominance? Absolutely not. It wouldn't be. There's absolutely almost zero chance. I, I think there's with, a really good chance that it would be somewhere because like all these tokens and things that we see happening, that all would have and could have been built on top of Bitcoin, but the Bitcoin core developers were openly hostile to it. So Vitalik... Yeah initially looked at building Ethereum on top of Bitcoin and the Bitcoin core developers were busy, you know, shortening the amount of data that could be put in the op return section of it. And so he decided, well, I guess I won't be able to build this on top of Bitcoin. I think he, I'll do I my think own thing. he still would have built it separately anyway. He's, he's openly said that one of the, the, the main place that he was looking originally was, was, uh, was Bitcoin. That was it's one. just an option, but, but there is entrepreneurial spirit. There, there is investment opportunity. There's speculation. I, I think when if you're going to make arguments, make the ones that people can get behind, not the ones market dominance would have fallen. There's yeah, well, here, here's another reason why I don't think that's the case. So the reason that Bitcoin wound up having much value, or, or the, you know, the value that it does today, is that it started to be used in commerce. So initially we had the Silk Road, and then later we had all sorts of normal businesses using Bitcoin in commerce. And because you can spend it anywhere, mm -hmm. people became willing to store the. <laughs> people became willing to store their value in it because they knew that they could spend it in these various places. So in order for any of these digital currencies out there to have, be, have a value and have a price is eventually they need to have some secondary use case. And the primary one is usefulness in commerce. Uh -huh. And uh, if you don't have that usefulness in commerce, I, I don't think you're going to you know, be picking a winner that's going to the moon. But they're not, they're not, they're not all commerce uh, solutions. There's asset tokenization there, you know. Well, that's the security ICO, too. There's so. ICOs. That, you know, there's, there is the use of blockchain for out, things outside of commerce. And that's why I'm saying I think dominance would have fallen anyway. Maybe it wouldn't be as low as it is. But I still think, I mean, you, you've I think taken fall, away part of the dominance. Sure. And, and I just told you the reason I, I took away yeah. part of the dominance is because I was worried about Bitcoin's uh, scalability in the future, not due to any technical problems, but due to these uh, social problems. So... Let me ask you another question. Okay, so if you could go back, we can go back two years, three years. You obviously had a relationship of some kind with the core team. You knew them. You spoke. I to had them. a very nice dinner yeah. with Adam back before, and cool. yeah, sure. At some point, things went wrong. You know, you've fallen out with them in one way or another. Have a disagreement on things. If you could go back, would you have done anything different? Would you have a different approach? Or are you perfectly happy with where we are right now? Uh, if I had a time machine and I could go back, I would have screamed and shouted and complained much, much, much more vigorously when the censorship started. And I didn't speak out loudly enough against the censorship that's still going on to this very day. So my biggest regret uh, is that I didn't speak out more strongly against the censorship. And I think my biggest mistake was not realizing just how big of an impact the censorship would have. Because when the censorship first started, uh, the very top most upvoted thread, I think, ever in the history of our Bitcoin was to remove Thamos as a moderator because everybody was in open revolt due to the censorship. And people said, you know, you know, F this. We don't need censorship. This is Bitcoin. We don't, we don't do censorship here. And then that thread was censored from our Bitcoin. And, uh, and now today we have a whole bunch of people that came to Bitcoin much more late, uh, recently, and they have no idea what the history of Bitcoin is. They have no idea about the censorship that was going on. They have no idea that the plan from day one was just to allow the blocks to increase as Bitcoin became more popular. And all these people that came to Bitcoin more recently, now they think that I'm the evil boogeyman trying to destroy Bitcoin, whereas in reality, I've poured my heart and soul into adopt, you know, helping cryptocurrencies be adopted worldwide as fast as I possibly can. And uh, so if I had that time machine to go back, I would have complained about the censorship even more strongly than, than I did. But so you therefore putting it all down to Thamos. We are exactly where we are just because of Thamos. It's not a hundred percent him, but a, a huge amount of the blame lies at his feet with the censorship. I mean, censorship is unforgivable. 
But do you not think there's a, you know, it seems to me there are a lot of really smart people within the core team who have an approach and, you know, and have ideas about how to scale Bitcoin. So a lot of these people are really, really smart people. You, you, and you keep saying they, they want to destroy Bitcoin and they no, want to... No, I, I don't think I've ever said that they uh, want to they, destroy they, Bitcoin. They want, it, they want it to be slow and expensive and, and I don't and think they do. And that they do. And I have direct quotes and I put together a whole presentation on and that. If they want it I, to be slow and expensive, why do they support Lightning Network? What, I mean, what's, what's so Lightning there? Network Bitcoins aren't Bitcoins. They're IOUs for Bitcoins to be settled on the network later. Mm-hmm. And that's a very big difference. Um, and you, there's actual quotes from you know Adam Back, the CEO of Blockstream, where he says he doesn't think that people would have a problem paying $100 per per transaction. And there's lots of quotes from these people saying that the fees becoming high are a good thing. Uh, Tur Demister, another one of these big uh, Bitcoin core supporters, is busy saying that he's looking forward to when the fees for on-chain transactions in the Bitcoin network are $1,000 each. Well, I have news for Tur and, and everybody else is that people aren't going to pay $1,000 fees. They're going to switch to something else. And that's what we've seen happening. So if you're... If your voice had been louder, how do you think things would have panned out differently? I, I I don't know, but I think if the censorship hadn't happened, whether or not that was because I my voice was louder, I think if the censorship hadn't happened, I think Bitcoin would have continued on its original path to where the block size would have increased and we would have had adoption from companies like Facebook and PayPal. Now, I, I know of a company that had more than 100 million, still has more than 100 million monthly active users that was busy in 2014, I think I met with them for the first time. Maybe it was 2015. They were, they were busy looking into integrating Bitcoin wallets into all of their 100 million monthly active users, right? So that mm-hmm. would essentially give maybe like 20x increase the number of people that could use Bitcoin from that time. And those plans were either completely put on hold or, or canceled at this point. Well, who, who was that? Uh, I, I can't say the, the company name, but uh, and I'm sure they weren't the only one, but it was an instant messaging so app why, why platform. Don't, why don't they just take Bitcoin Cash now? Then? Uh, hopefully they will be soon. So, yeah. yeah well, and, and we just saw one with, uh, you know, 33 million users on uh, YeChat announced this morning mentioned. that they're doing that. Like, that that seems to be a pretty big deal. Like, I wasn't familiar with that app previously, but uh, I think I'm going to have to download it and give it a try now. And, uh Jeff Garzik talked about this a lot, the fidelity problem. A lot of businesses looked at Bitcoin. Even before the blocks had become full, they said, oh, well, if we bring all of our users onto this, we'd need blocks that are you know bigger than, than one megabyte, whatever it be. We'd fill up the blocks instantly. So I guess Bitcoin doesn't have the capacity for us, so we'll, we'll do something else. And uh, whereas Bitcoin Cash, you know, in a couple more days here, they're going to fork. So the maximum block size is 32 megabytes from the 8 megabytes that it is today. That doesn't mean the blocks are going to be 32 megabytes overnight, but it means that companies like Fidelity or Facebook or or, you know, Telegram or Take Your Pick, they're going to look and say, oh, Bitcoin Cash does have the capacity. If we were to bring all our users on board, they could handle our our, our user base. Mm-hmm. And people are going to start building on top of Bitcoin Cash, whereas they look at Bitcoin Core today, Lightning Network, I hope it works. I hope it's fantastic. But the fact of the matter is, is it doesn't today. And it probably won't for a long, long time. These things take time, right? And they do take time. Yeah. And, and But there does appear to be some really clever, brilliant minds working on this. And I can't, I can't believe they're just... They're just deluded fools. So they're clever, brilliant minds within their domain. Yeah. So Adam Back is a much, 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 much better cryptography than I am. So is, uh, you know, Greg Maxwell. Mm-hmm. Both of those people have no clue when it comes to economics. Uh, both of those people have no clue when it comes to running a business either. Uh, otherwise, they would be out there doing that. They have no experience in that field. So, so, and so it doesn't mean that they're stupid people. Like I, I, you know, if you ask me to go out there and design, you know, a new cryptographic system for some, you know, new digital currency. Mm-hmm. I would take you know years or decades of study in that field before I would be able to do something even remotely competent. So, it, um, whereas so I you have need both, we absolutely need so, both. So, where where is okay? Two questions for you then. Where is the where are the brilliant cryptographers here? Uh, we have some fantastic developers on Bitcoin Cash, absolutely. And so, if if you look at Mike Hearn, he was a professional capacity planner for Google, one of the most popular mm-hmm. websites in the entire world. Mm-hmm. And he said, "Hey, we need to plan for Bitcoin to have more capacity so we can get people using it." Okay. And a bunch of these people basically drove him from the project. Like, if that's not some fantastic experience being a professional capacity planner for Google, you know, if that's not fantastic experience for planning for Bitcoin's future, you know, nothing is. Okay, where. <laughs> If you had to self-reflect, where would a fair criticism of you be then? Self-reflection is hard. Um, it's not. I can tell you that I'm crap at tech, and that's why I'm not debating uh, uh, really deep technical things with you. I am uh, a little bit disorganized and sometimes turn up to things late. Oh, that's self-reflection. Okay. Where can you, like, you know, because you're, you give a really solid argument. Every argument has a solid counter-argument. One thing I never hear from you is, do you know what? 
I think they're right. Ah, oh, shit, I got that wrong. Like, I'm just, like, just interested because sure, you've got a lot yeah, of pressure yeah, yeah. on your shoulders. I can give you an exact example of that. So there's a YouTube video of me saying we're so lucky to have the core team and we're so, you know, thankful. I'm so thankful to have people like, and I, I think I name names like Adam Back and Greg Maxwell and these other people. There's a video of me on YouTube saying we are so lucky in the Bitcoin community to have these people. That's, that's what I was what wrong. I mean. No, no, that's I was wrong. No, you, that's not what I mean. I like, I, and that's almost a perfect example. I've seen loads of times where you're, um, there's always a video or something. Actually, I watched one this morning on Steam it where you're like defending lies against yourself. There's always a counter argument. I'm just saying. So there's a lot of lies about me out there on the internet, and it's hard to correct them with all the censorship that's been going on on our Bitcoin. And that's but, not to say I'm not perfect. Come there's on. no such thing as okay, real. So Jesus, where, where right? are you at fault? Where are you at fault in the plenty of plenty of things. So name me some. Um, in in Bitcoin specifically, or my life in general. So you, whatever whatever you whatever yeah. you want to tell me, but it'd be good because like I'm trying to understand you. I'm trying to understand what your motivations are, but also you've you've got the weight of. Sounds like it feels like you're carrying the weight of Bitcoin and the world on your shoulders, and you've got to get this right. Where, but you seem to be quite isolated doing it. You know, it's like you're there on your own, and you've maybe got a bit of Craig Ride and a, a bit of uh, Calvin, and you know. Whereas there's a whole group of people on the Bitcoin side who will work together. So everybody that that supports the big block side of things. Um... They see what happens to me and how I get attacked constantly. So, like, um, we saw what happened Brian Armstrong, right? He used to be very strongly in favor of on-chain scaling and bigger blocks for Bitcoin. And he was attacked viciously by Bitcoin's core supporters. Coinbase was removed from Bitcoin.org as even being listed as a, as a Bitcoin website where people can buy Bitcoins. And eventually he just got tired with it and moved on with his life and moved on with his Bitcoin. The same thing happened with, you know, Mike Hearn and Gavin and Dreesen and, and a bunch of other people and a bunch of people that are still CEOs of big giant cryptocurrency businesses and cryptocurrency wallets that used to be Bitcoin businesses and Bitcoin wallets. And because of the Bitcoin scalability issues, they're now cryptocurrency exchanges and crypto coin wallets. But they contacted me uh, privately lots of times and still recently saying, hey, Roger, thank you for continuing to speak out. Um, thank you. I'm, I'm glad I don't have to do that. But you know, you're, you're on the right side of this. Keep going. Which is cool. But again, back to my point. <laughs> where, where, yeah, where, where have I the, made mistakes? Yeah, come on, where are the fair criticisms of you? Where are the things? What, what have sure. you got wrong or fucked up in this process? I think because you know what I think. I don't think anyone really hears this, and I think if they hear that, if they can hear that your mistakes and the things you got wrong, they're going to buy your other arguments. But if every, if every, everything thrown at you has a counter argument, uh, a, a defense, a YouTube video, you can point them to. It's kind of like, well, this guy's never fucking wrong. No, I'm, I'm sure I'm wrong about lots of things, but that's the thing about being wrong is when you make the mistake, you don't realize that it's a mistake or you wouldn't have made it. And uh, looking back on your past and, and recognizing those things as, as mistakes, that's hard to do. But uh, I can tell you one, I, I absolutely should not have given John Carvalho the middle finger. Uh, I absolutely should not have done that. Uh, yeah, but like I, he I was winding you that. up. And I, I, I think, you, you yeah, know, I, I, don't th I don't think anyone had a problem with the middle finger. Do you know what I think people had a problem with? Tell me. I think people had a problem with the way you kind of belittled his business at first, and then you also use the argument, I'm a multimillionaire. I think that's what... I think, look, we've all been wound up in times and stuck our middle fingers up. I don't... I think... And he was goading you, right? He he, he was set out to go to... He, he was an Ali G-esque or Borat interview. He, which he, is a shame, because actually, I think he put some really good arguments in through the whole process. And I think if that... If that hadn't have ended like that, it was a solid interview. Now people just look at it as a as a as a meme for you and miss out on the solid debate beforehand. But I don't think people cared about the middle finger. That's that's just the ammo you gave them. Okay, I, I think you're right. You're right about this too. So like uh, the argument that you know I already made a bunch of money um, isn't an argument that 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 people enjoy and, and find persuasive. So I, I think you're, you're right about that, that there's better arguments to be made. Um, but an argument that I do think is accurate that I've seen time and time again is that so many of these Bitcoin core supporters, they don't actually use Bitcoin. They don't have Bitcoin wallets on their phones. They don't use on, people to pay again. for it. We're doing it again. So this is brilliant. It's like really cool to hear you like admit something. And, it, and I, I find that really interesting. But, but, but that's been now counteracted well, with like... I'm going to go and do a Bitcoin core thing. And it's just kind of like... Well, here, here, here's, the, the, I guess, the reason why I support Bitcoin Cash. It's like I, I definitely had made some money before Bitcoin had ever even been invented. I made a heck of a lot more of it through Bitcoin. But it was by using it in commerce and using it to pay people all around the world all day, every day, and appreciating Bitcoin's usefulness as, as money. You said you, you know, one of your other very recent interviews was with uh, Lynn Ulbricht, the, yeah. the mother of Ross Ulbricht. Um, you know, it, what, that's probably one of the most successful 
startups, not just Bitcoin startups, startups ever in the entire history of the world. He's one of the most successful entrepreneurs ever mm. by using Bitcoin in commerce. Yeah. Um, whereas I, in the, you know, I've had discussions or, or debates with people like Jimmy Song and Tone Vase and, uh, and others. And I asked them, hey, get out your Bitcoin wallet. I'm going to send you some Bitcoin right now. And they don't have Bitcoin wallets. But what's this got to do with the question I just asked you? I think that it has to do with uh, the mentality between both sides. So I was trying to argue that, like, I made a whole bunch of money through Bitcoin, so you should listen to me. And the other side... No, you said I'd made a whole bunch of money before I got into Bitcoin. Which is true. Yeah. But And then I used that bunch of money that I made to buy a bunch of Bitcoin, and that's done even better, right? See, I wonder whether you've just had so many attacks now, like your, your auto-response is defense, and your auto-defense is Bitcoin calls terrible. Or these, and it's just like, you know, for me, trying to... Trying to, trying to, you know, trying my best to be impartial, trying my best to see both sides. And it's, you know, it's a hard thing to do because if you ever show any, like, I'm sure from this, people are going to say, oh, you didn't attack Roger enough. Oh, you said some things which, which, which are good for Bitcoin uh, cash. You're a fucking idiot. I'm going to get Welcome that. to the club. <laughs> yeah, welcome to the club. And I'm trying to be as impartial as I can. Um, I, 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 you know, I told you long term, I believe Bitcoin, what you would call Bitcoin Core, what I would call Bitcoin, is on the right path. I think it's a shame. Do you? What yes. is the right path? I think, no. I'm going to answer that shortly because we are deviating from my point. Okay. This is one of the first times I've seen you um, admit something, like a, a, like a weakness and, and a fault. And actually, your whole demeanor's changed. And I'm, I feel like I'm, I'm not sat across defensive Roger who's arguing with everyone. I feel like I'm sat across... The person, Roger, and that's really interesting. Well, I think also because you're not here trying to push my buttons like John Carvalho was intentionally. Yeah, but, yeah. And but I, I am trying to push your buttons. But I'm trying to push different buttons. Okay, well, I'm, you're pushing them in a way that I'm, I'm enjoying. I'm really enjoying our conversation. So, 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 I think it's really good to admit that. I think I think other there's plenty of other mistakes you've probably made. Sure. Fuck. Um, I mean, I've made mistakes. That's probably why I'm divorced. But yeah, you know, um, Andreas. I think what happened with Andreas. So I think people completely misinterpreted what, what I said. Yeah, but the, the point was... And is then that, spun it around to use it to attack me. That's what I think I think there. the point was is that you there's almost any chance to jump on and promote Bitcoin Cash. You use it. And and that, that what felt like, rather than looking at the real issues... The so, same, the same so here, I'll, I'll, that, that tweet about if Andreas had held on to even yeah. $200 worth of Bitcoin, he'd be a millionaire today. Yeah. That wasn't an attack or insult on Andreas. That was, that was simply just a statement of fact. Uh, but here's an attack or, or an but, but insult it, on Andreas that I'll give right now. Oh. Andreas, you need to speak out about the censorship that's going on. It's absolutely unforgivable that you're not shouting from high heaven about the censorship that's going on within the community. And just because the censorship is supporting a position that you might take doesn't mean that the censorship is okay. So shame on you, Andreas, for not speaking out against the censorship. And uh, in regards to I'm not sure he listens to my show, but maybe he will, he will listen to this one. Maybe. And then uh, in regards to you know patents, you mentioned earlier, like uh, Craig Wright seems to be a big fan of patents. Uh, I think patents are an illegitimate government-granted monopoly and shouldn't even exist. So, so, so I'll okay. say that you know flat out, like patents are illegitimate, and I don't support the very concept of patents. So, so let's talk shame about on anybody Craig. that's busy applying for patents. Let's talk about Craig, because I met him. I don't believe he's Satoshi. Um, I said if Satoshi was a bunch of people, he might be one of them, and he might have been involved early on. I don't believe he's Satoshi. I think his involvement in Bitcoin Cash is counterproductive to what you're trying to achieve. I think he actually turns people off, and I think his whole approach to patents is completely against everything which Bitcoin originally stood for. What are your thoughts on that? I completely agree on the patent front. Okay. So... Are you challenging him on this? Yeah, I, I, you know, we're, we're recording this. This is going to go on the internet. But have you had the so open could, discussion could, with him? Uh, he said, "Come on, Craig, what the fuck are you doing here, mate?" I don't think we've had the, the patent talk, but uh, I'll, I'll tell you, hey, Craig, okay. if you ever wind up listening to this, patents are not not cool, not okay. Please don't. But do you do you think it needs a bit more than just a slight mention like that? What what? No, I mean, don't be you as think forceful like, as you'd like. Patents. I, no, I mean, don't you think you should like? Be sitting down with him and having a chat. Him well, and Jamie I don't. And I don't have tea with those guys. I, and I, I see them occasionally. And the next time I see him, I'll mention to him like, "Hey, patents are an illegitimate government granted monopoly that uh, stifle the rate of economic growth of the entire world." So I'm, I'm philosophically and economically opposed to the very idea of patents. It, I think that's pretty pretty yeah, straightforward. I, I do. Right? I do. I just I'm just surprised you haven't had the direct conversation with him about. So it. I think a lot of people think that I'm like busy conspiring every day with Craig or no, Amory or like you know all it. these. I, I do know him, but uh, 
I'm busy at the office here every single day working with my Bitcoin.com team, and, and Craig's off in, in London or wherever he is. So I, I'm, I'm sure it's probably easier for you to have that patent talk with him than it is for me. I get, so. I get, um, when I spoke with him, I just go around in circles and get lost. And uh, what did you make of um, what Vitalik said about him shouldn't be allowed at uh, conferences because he's a fraud? I disagree with Vitalik on that front. Okay, and why is that? And I'm not agreeing or disagreeing, by the way. Yeah, well, um, I think Craig Wright has some really, really interesting things to say. Um, and I think that they're worth hearing. And maybe he's wrong about some things, but maybe he's right about some other things. And uh, I've learned a lot of things uh, from him that uh, I didn't know previously uh, about Bitcoin specifically uh, as well as a number of other things. So I found my conversations with him to be very, very, very interesting. Um, but like lots of really, really smart people, he can be a, a bit of a difficult character. Um but that, that's the world we live in, and, and that's okay. And uh, I, I don't think that uh, I don't think that Craig needs to be shunned from conferences or that sort of thing. So, do you think he's Satoshi? Um, I don't think I want to make a public statement one way or another in regards to that. So, am I allowed to interpret your body language? I don't think I shifted positions, but feel free. So. Um, I interpret your body language there as... You know, you know what I'll tell you? I'll, t I'll tell you, I, I honestly don't know. Um, but I, I definitely would not rule it out. But okay. I don't think he's the one and only Satoshi. And even Craig claims that uh, that there were multiple people involved and that he was just a part of it. Um, but I, and at the end of the day, if I can add one more to you, yeah. I, I, don't, I don't think it matters. Um, I think it matters. Tell me why. Well, if he was which he isn't, but if he was, I think uh, it destroys the hero picture everybody has of Satoshi because, you know, he he admitted to me he's a bit of a dick. Um, he said that, and um, he is, and he's he doesn't come across as a libertarian and he doesn't come across about anyone who really cares about anyone but himself. He actually comes across as a bit of a sociopath, if you ask me. And I, I think that kills the dream for a lot of people. Um, they also, always say, don't, don't ever meet your heroes. Well, right? yeah. So. Um, but the, the bigger issue is, is also it opens up the potential. There's uh, a, whole, uh, a, a liquid 1 million Bitcoins or so, which are, could enter the ecosystem, which isn't great. And I also then, his opinion will matter in, in a different way. And I think it's better that, like I, I, I don't like the argument Satoshi's vision. I really I don't. I, I don't know. You did a conference called it. I didn't do a conference. Well, oh, so come that, that, on! You're like you must have been involved in the conference, right? Uh, we we gave them some money to sponsor the conference, but we sponsored like almost every conference that's happening. So but you I, often talk about Satoshi's vision, Satoshi's white paper. I, I do you know what it really? I tell you why it really bothers me. It's because unless he's here to defend himself or give an argument or counter argument. Mm -hmm. We're putting the mouth, putting words in the mouth of either a dead person or a person who doesn't want to give their opinion anymore. So I, I don't think that we should support Satoshi's vision because it's Satoshi's vision. I think we should support it because we have like seven or eight years of empirical evidence showing that it worked and worked incredibly well. And I think it's the empirical evidence that's the important part, not the fact that it was Satoshi's vision. Empirical evidence that on the block size, right? Up until the point the blocks were full. Bitcoin had massive adoption around the world and was gaining steam every single year with more and more transactions happening every, every year. Don't disagree with you. Don't disagree and as soon as the blocks became full, the adoption rate reversed. Don't disagree with you on, on some of that. But I do believe that the people who are developing on the Bitcoin core are trying to build something that is, as I think Jameson put it, multi-generational. That's going to work in 10, 20, 30 years a continual increase in the block size might not work. I think you're wrong about that. Thanks to Moore's law, just increasing the block size is a long-term scaling solution because computers are going to get faster and better and cheaper every single year. It's going to be, it's going to, that's been happening for decades and it's going to continue to happen for decades. But we don't know that it will work. 
the same as we don't know lightning network will work it, it's a theory. which do you think is a bigger risk the fact that you, you think that the putting all of our our risk on the fact that moore's law will continue and it has a decade long thing or putting our risk and and faith and hope in that lightning network will be able to be created something that's never existed ever and has you no know, past track record I, I, I wouldn't even argue because there are people who are smarter and better than this than me and and well, know what do you about think this. with your smarts well, well, you and, and intellect I think, I think it's cool that both are happening because we will see which one works okay do you know i what? agree with that we will see sure. in 10 years time and do you know what? probably both will exist back to craig beard satoshi i think that would be very bad and i think a non uh, satoshi said anonymous is much better for the world with the climbing case everything might change some interesting evidence in there there is so. definitely some interesting evidence and i think there's probably more to come I've, there's a british reporter you should interview i forget his name andrew corrigan or something like that that uh, wrote the it takes it's an hour long read or so. It's almost like a miniature book, but with all the stuff it. that went on, yeah, like he seems to be convinced that Craig is Satoshi from from the way I read it, which was interesting and, and surprising to me. I think a few people are, but I think there's enough doubts. Um, yeah, you know, was that your takeaway as, as someone who doesn't think Craig is Satoshi? Do you think that Andrew thought at the end of it all he I thought, thought that Craig was Satoshi? I think he left doubt himself. He had. Probably like a few people had a suspicion he might be. See, it's funny. I think, I think most people who claim he isn't claim he isn't because they don't want him to be. And there isn't enough technical evidence. And very smart people. I think those who claim he is don't have enough proof that he is. And I think Craig likes living in this world where he might, might, might not be. In my view, if he, the only way he is is he was part of the team and has kind of edged his way in there, possibly waited for people to die as as sad as that sounds for him to go and claim the 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 crown but i don't believe he's him um I, you think he was part of the team part or close to them now you know what he could have been somebody who was brought on as a salesman <laughs> somebody brought on in, in i don't know i mean i'm trying to I, something i don't even know or understand but i don't believe the way he behaves now i don't believe that is the same person but i believe he could have been involved but I don't think he's good for the crypto community, personally. Um, I enjoyed meeting him, enjoyed our interview, but I just think he he brings too much negativity in. And, you know, you're talking about e- economic freedom. He really just seems to be interested in lining his own pockets. And that's a very different person from you and a very different person from a lot of people who in the community. And I just don't think it's good. Um, but then, that saying that, I don't agree with Vitalik trying to essentially censor him. Because I don't know what that achieves. So, what's the end goal here? Let's go back to that. The end goal for for you. When do you feel like you've achieved, and will there become a time you can step away from this and just because this must suck a lot away from your life? I'm I'm enjoying it each day, so it, it's okay. So my my end goal is to see a complete separation of money and state, when which governments are no longer in control of uh, of the money supply. And then from there, I would like to see a complete separation of, uh, you know, society and state or, or, or the people in the state, because I don't think we need one centralized group of people bossing everybody else around. How do you think that actually happens? Like, how do you envisage the, the scenario where uh, money and state are separated? Like, I, what are I, the steps? I think it's through technology, not through lobbying and begging for permission from the people that claim the right to rule over us. Because if, if you have a slave master and you ask your slave master for permission not to be a slave anymore, of course he's going to tell you no. And I think that's kind of the end result from you know lobbying and, and politicking. Whereas if we can build the tools to where technologically the state is powerless to prevent people from controlling their own destiny and their own finances and their own economic activity, well, that's a lot much, much, much more powerful tool than, than lobbying for politicians to do something. So, uh, I want to build the technological tools to empower the individual to have more control over their own lives. And do you see that first happening in a country like Venezuela, where it's almost an economic collapse, where people are transacting using Bitcoin in a, a, because they have to? Do you see it coming from, from that way? No, I, I think it can come from any individual anywhere in the world that winds up with the mindset that, hey, I can control my own destiny. I can control my own life. Thanks to the invention of cryptocurrencies, I can I can do what I want financially. Uh, I think that's powerful. Aren't you starting your own country? We're we're looking to start our own non-country, and hopefully we can find a uh, you know a jurisdiction somewhere in the world that will sell us a big swath of land and grant us sovereignty with that land, and then we'll set up the world's first uh, non-country. How's that going? 
Um, so the main guy behind it, uh, unfortunately, has been having a lot of issues with uh, his existing government giving him a hard time. So he's been distracted with uh, with those issues. But I think he has most of them resolved at this point. So hopefully that'll be uh, back on track and full steam ahead here uh, soon. So I've been a bit of the spokesperson for it, whereas he's been the guy that's supposed to actually do the legwork for it. So uh, unfortunately, he's uh, you know had that slight delay, but hopefully he'll be back on track soon. In India, I can't remember the name of it, which is... It's kind of a separate state. Do you know the place? There's quite a few places around the world that kind of have things like that going on. So uh, another one that, of course, I'd love to mention is Liberland, which is a slice of land between Croatia and Serbia that both countries are claiming doesn't belong to them. Uh, and so this one, you know, smart guy came and said, yeah, OK, this is now Liberland. And he's trying to start uh, the world's first kind of, you know, anarcho-capitalist It'll be more of a country than the one that the Free Society Project uh, is working on, but uh, it'll still be pretty darn good where all taxes are voluntary and all government services are, you know, you, you interact with them voluntarily. And so uh, myself and Bitcoin.com, we've been supporting them in a major way as well. Uh, do, so, do you think that can happen? Do you think this can happen globally? If you think that it can't happen, you're right. If you think that something can happen, you might be right. So thinking that something's impossible... That's no fun. So, uh, of course, uh, if you don't try, you're guaranteed not to succeed. So we're going to try in as many places around the world with as many different routes and methods to liberate more people around the world from centralized control of politicians. And uh, hopefully at least one of them will succeed. Do you, and do you think, you know, you denounced your citizenship? To you? So I have a question. For, I see yeah. so many people saying that you like and I will gladly denounce with a D the, the very concept of citizenship. But like I, I read something. Did I read that wrong? Well, every, the actual term is renouncing, so I've, oh, I've renounced, renounced but everyone's saying denouncing, which to me has a yeah. very different connotation. And I, I'm happy to denounce <laughs> the very idea of citizenship, but uh, what I actually did in regards to my U.S. citizenship was renounce my U.S. citizenship with R, and I haven't been living in the U.S. for well over a decade. Why was that? I mean, I know you, you obviously you, you spent some time in prison. And... Yep. That was the main reason. Um, they treated me incredibly unfairly. Uh, in the U.S., and I didn't want to, you know, have anything to do with those people. So I, I initially moved out of the country, and then when I saw Bitcoin coming along, I, I realized, oh, the U.S. government's probably going to cause all sorts of trouble for people using Bitcoin. So what was I prison should... like? Mainly, it was really boring really? from day to day. Like there, with with occasional moments of uh, you know incredible excitement, but incredible in a bad way. Like if if things are inciting in prison, it's not for a good reason. Right. Okay. Um, because shit's kicking off. Because bad things are happening. Yeah. So I, if it. You don't want to have exciting times in prison. So right. for the most part, every day is just really, really, really boring uh, more than anything else. But uh, if I start telling prison stories, this one will get into, uh, you know, being even longer than it is already. But uh, You got one? Um, yeah, I have, I have a lot. But uh, you know what? I, I think if you don't mind, I'm going to plug. Uh, I've started my own YouTube channel recently, and I'm trying to post stuff. Plug it, yeah. And uh, I'll I'll post some prison stories on on Roger Veer's YouTube channel at some point Roger very Veer soon. Prison stories, yeah, <laughs> including you know I'll, I'll I'll tell a story soon about you know literally being tortured by prison guards. So yourself, myself personally, yeah, I'll tell that story soon. I have I have lots of uh, good as an interesting prison stories. So Fuck. yeah. So I think we've found a natural conclusion. I know you spared me two hours, but I think I think it's been a very good interview. It's been great to meet you and talk to you in person. And, and I've enjoyed it too. Thank you. Um, I'd like to do it again in the future, uh, find out more about the project that's ongoing. Um, and yeah, if, is there anything you want to leave? Anything, any final notes, any final comments? And uh... Yeah, if, if you're not sure on this whole debate between Bitcoin Core and Bitcoin Cash, uh, try using both and then decide for yourself which one is more useful. And uh, we have a great tool over at free.bitcoin.com. We'll give anybody in the world about 15 cents worth of Bitcoin cash uh, for free if you go to free.bitcoin.com. 15 cents? Point oh 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 one Bitcoin Cash. So that by the time we put this online, it, it'll be something other than 15 cents. Yeah. It was about 10 cents when we started. So. Okay. Uh, great to meet you. My pleasure. Thank you. Okay. So what did you make of that? I hope you enjoyed it. Um, I did. I definitely enjoyed it. I definitely saw a different side to Roger from the, the person I've kind of come to imagine he is from everything online. I just think he's kind of lost in this world where he's being attacked all the time. And, and I don't think his approach to defending or growing Bitcoin cash is right. And I don't think the I think he's actually, you know, damaged Bitcoin itself. That said, you know, plenty of forks exist. You know, we have open source technology. Anyone has the right to fork and create their own technology. I just don't agree with the approach. But I do like 
Roger. I think he's a nice guy. I think he's probably... I think people have probably got misconceptions about him like I had. And I think when you get to meet somebody, you can go in with with all the opinions you want. But if you just meet somebody who's a nice person, they're just, they are just a nice person. And he does do a whole bunch of stuff for other people outside of this. So, yeah, no, I like the guy. I'm sure I'm going to get a lot of people, you know, have a pop at me and have a go at me or throw some bull crap my way. But, you know, so be it. I put myself out here and I accept it. Um, but yeah, do you know? Feel free to get in touch. I'd love to hear your opinion, whatever it is. Um, so yeah, next week I'm going to be in New York. I've got about four interviews lined up. One, a kind of different one, which is going to be very interesting, which I can't tell you about now. But if it happens, it's yeah, it's definitely interesting. And then some other people in the space, and I might have my first repeat guest. Uh, somebody who's been on the show before, which will be pretty cool. So, yeah, please feel free to get in touch. Please support the show. We'd love to hear from you. I've got one night left in Tokyo, so I'm going to go out and have a drink and fly back to the UK tomorrow. Okay, have a great week. Mm-hmm.